Good morning. I'm honored to welcome each of you here today to the White House Summit on Human Trafficking, honoring the 20th anniversary of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. On behalf of the President, thank you for joining me to celebrate this milestone and to recognize the incredible work that has been done across this country to tackle modern day slavery, pursue justice for victims, and hold traffickers accountable. Thank you to Attorney General Barr, Secretary Scalia, Secretary Azar, Acting Secretary Wolf, Deputy Secretary Bygum for all being here today. Under your leadership and in coordination with the full of government, the United States is committed to ending human trafficking in all of its grotesque and evil forms. I'm also grateful to be joined by so many members of Congress and special guests, including Congressman Smith, Congresswoman Wagner. Yes. Please stand. Congressman McCall, Ambassador at Large, yes. <laughs> Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, Brownback. and U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Callista Gingrich. Thank you, Callista. <laughs> Further among us, and I'd love you all to stand as well, are members of the U.S. Advisory Council on Human Trafficking, the President's Public-Private Partnership Advisory Council to End Human Trafficking, as well as recipients of the Presidential Award for Extraordinary Efforts to Combat Trafficking in Persons. Thank you. Each of you possess a wealth of knowledge and action-oriented approach that are invaluable resources in this fight against this crime and as we seek to best support survivors. Human trafficking is believed to be one of the largest criminal activities in the world with an estimated 24.9 million people trapped in forced labor, domestic servitude, or commercial sex trafficking. It is also, sadly, one of the most lucrative illegal industries worldwide, generating over $150 billion in annual profit. This issue has no demographic limitations and explo exploits society's most vulnerable, often women and children, and particularly targets runaway and homeless youth. In 1983, Robert Fuller and Louis Molteris Two middle-aged men, both born with intellectual disabilities, were discovered working on a dairy farm in Chelsea, Michigan. Isolated from the world, these two men were working 17-hour days with no pay and living in squalor. They were hidden in plain sight. The ruling of United States versus Kominsky, as Robert and Lewis's case would come to be known, recognized that the U.S. involuntary servitude and slavery statutes were not sufficient in their scope, lacking necessary provisions to guarantee protections for these men and so many others. This case spurred what would become a national outcry for legislation to address modern day slavery. In 2000, Congress responded. Under the leadership, of former Senator Sam Brownback and Representative Chris Smith, whom you'll hear from shortly, Congress passed the monumental bipartisan Trafficking Victims Protection Act. This landmark piece of legislation changed the landscape of the conversation around human trafficking and elevated the U.S. government's capabilities to combat this evil. The TVPA created a number of protections for victims, ensuring that they had access to necessary services. It also sharpened prosecution capabilities, criminalizing a broader scope of human trafficking related crimes and requiring convicted traffickers to provide full restitution to their victims. The TVPA enhanced prevention efforts as well, creating for the first time in U.S. history an office to monitor and combat trafficking in persons within the State Department. 
The TIP office, currently led by Ambassador-at-Large John Richmond, is tasked with producing the annual trafficking in person report that serves as our key diplomatic tool to engage foreign governments on tackling this issue collectively. It goes without saying that the guests in this room at the TVPA ushered in a new era in anti-trafficking -traf work. Over the past 20 years, this legislation has shaped how our country pursues justice for victims, holds traffickers accountable, and prevents further cases of trafficking. So that brings us today. Much progress has been made, but we recognize that this issue is still unfortunately so pervasive in our own communities and across the globe. In the early days of this administration, President Trump committed to bringing the full force and weight of the US government to tackling this horrific problem. Since then, I'm proud to have helped him deliver on this promise, signing nine pieces of legislation into law that directly address human trafficking. And we're just getting started. These bills, amongst other things, expanded on the provisions of the TVPA of 2000 to include required law enforcement victim training and HHS grants authority for academic institutions to educate teachers and students of signs of sex and labor trafficking and so much more. In 2017, President Trump signed an executive order to dismantle transnational criminal organizations, including those trafficking human beings. This action elevated human trafficking as a national security issue as traffickers' profits enrich their organizations at the expense of human lives. Further, the President has prioritized funding for anti-trafficking work, proposing a $42 million budget increase for 2021 that will enhance human trafficking investigations, <laughs> prosecutions, and victim services. We are resolved and we are relentless in the fight to hold perpetrators accountable and restore human dignity for victims. This administration has fought and will continue to fight this crime and ensure that survivors can access the services they need. Human trafficking is not solely an international issue or a crime that must occur across borders. Human beings are being sold right here in America, in our own backyards and in our own communities in neighborhoods across this country, in rural and urban communities, as well as tribal lands. We cannot turn a blind eye to trafficking that happens at home, and we cannot tolerate the exploitation of our own citizens. <laughs> the prevalence of domestic trafficking was brought to a new light for me on a recent visit to Atlanta. Facing one of the nation's highest rates of human trafficking, the city of Atlanta has taken big strides forward to equip survivors with long-term care and the skills they need to succeed as they begin to rebuild their lives. One of those facilities leading this effort in Atlanta is Wellspring Living, a nonprofit providing a path forward to survivors of domestic sex trafficking. Wellspring's motto is to live and dream again, a beautiful testament to what I witnessed that day. I met incredible, courageous women in Wellspring Living's Women's Academy, which is dedicated to helping survivors attain skills for their GED, an apprenticeship, and a future career. A few of those ladies join us here today, including Jessica Hamlet. Jessica's story is one of remarkable transformation. Jessica shared with me her very personal and heartbreaking experience of being trafficked for sex domestically after surviving childhood abuse, losing custody of her children, and facing serious challenges with drug addiction herself. Despite all this, Jessica recently completed an apprenticeship at Delta Airlines, regained custody of her beautiful, sweet daughter, who I had the honor of meeting that day in Atlanta, and now works full-time for the city. Her resilience is inspiring, 
And I would be honored if Jessica would come up and say just a few words. Good morning. My name is Jessica Hamlet, and I am a resilient and creative woman who is here for, to share a story of hope. My life didn't start out looking very hopeful. Actually, I was born into a situation that set me up for failure. At the age of eight, I was introduced to drugs and was exploited at the age of 12. For years, I found myself in the middle of violence and also addiction, a constant nightmare of having to do things that no human being should be forced to do or made to do. I thought this was just the way that life was supposed to be. Until about five years ago, I met a woman named Tammy, a Delta flight attendant, who has worked with women inside the jail where I was incarcerated. Tammy realized I was a victim and not a criminal. But I was facing 25 years in prison. And after two years of fighting for me, the judge as well as the statewide prosecutor was able to say that they agreed to send me to a program so that I could have a chance at life. <sighs> a constant nightmare of having to do these things had me feeling as if I was never going to have a chance at life. I couldn't believe that Wellspring was going to be able to accept me after doing an interview with them. We applied and I got in. I think I cried the whole day. <laughs> I couldn't believe there was a way out and there could be hope for me. Getting into Wellspring was easy, staying was hard, really hard. I packed my bags about seven different times and said I couldn't do this or maybe I should just go. But I didn't, I didn't leave at all. My program coordinator, Andrea Hipwell, And the people there loved and accepted me in such a way that I thought I was being set up. I didn't even know what love looked like. I thought it couldn't be real, but it was. They helped me work through my trauma. I got my GED, and, I, and they as well prepared me for getting a job, and not just a job, but a career. As well as getting a paid in apprenticeship and then they wouldn't believe, or you guys wouldn't believe, I got an apprenticeship with Delta, Delta Airlines. My first day at Delta, there was flowers and a cup, and it said, welcome aboard, Jessica. Welcome to the team. I felt like I was at home. I felt like I had family that knew how to love me and wanted to see me successful. I even got to eat lunch with the Vice President of Delta in Flight Services, Allison Osban. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. When my apprenticeship was complete, I got a job at the City of Atlanta watershed, and I absolutely love where I'm at today. I am in my own apartment, and I'm also with three of my children, and I am doing very hard work. That hard work consists of basketball practice, football practice, <laughs> lots of homework. Um, there's lots of challenges, and, but I also have all of my children in counseling, and we do lots of therapy. It is still hard, but five years ago, I had no hope. My hope wouldn't even have happened without God. And so many people like Tammy, Allison, Andrea, and of course, my mentor, Cindy, who is now with me today. Today I'm filled with hope and wanting to share my story of hope and for the thousands of kids and women who are being exploited. Thank you, Ms. Ivanka, for allowing me to be here, for helping me and helping other women today.
Jessica, you have shown courage and resilience that few of us will ever know, and we are so grateful for you being here and sharing your very powerful voice with all of us today, so, so thank you. No human being deserves to live without agency or without hope for a future. So let us recognize the vigorous work of all those who bring us to this point in history. As a nation, we have taken great strides in combating modern day slavery, but there's still so much more left to do. We must continue our efforts and we will be successful in ending this evil scourge. Thank you all so much for being here. And with that, I would like to welcome Attorney General Barr, who has been such a formidable champion on this issue, to come up and join us and say a few words. Thank you all. Thank you, Ivanka. And thank you for your, your energetic leadership on this issue and for hosting uh, this important summit this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge Jessica and thank you for sharing your story and for your courage. And I'd like to, to say to, uh, to all the survivors, uh, I want you to know how grateful we are uh, for all that you do in fighting to free uh, other victims from the grip of this modern day slavery. Now, as we all know, January has been Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and as the month comes to a close, I can assure you that our campaign against this scourge will drive forward with greater energy and deeper commitment. The Department of Justice will continue to bring the full force of the law against those who exploit other human beings by subjecting them to the physical and psychological captivity involved in this horrific crime. Now human trafficking is, we all know, modern day slavery, and it is a crime of exploitation. It comes in innumerable forms and it involves no single type of victim. Sometimes those who are abused are homeless, Sometimes they're undocumented aliens or runaway children, uh, or there are, they are people who have become addicted to drugs, or just simply impressionable minors. Emblematic in many ways uh, is one horrific case I was briefed on recently in the Southern District of New York. A very dedicated team of prosecutors doggedly pursued a few little leads and ended up convicting 19 defendants in Manhattan with sex trafficking of minor girls and young women in the New York State child welfare system. In other words, children whose society had a special obligation to protect ended up being instead exploited. In this, as in every case, a person who gains leverage or power over a vulnerable victim exploits them for their own gain. There's nothing more predatory or disgusting. As you are aware, this year marks the 20th anniversary of the Victims Trafficking and Violence Protection Act, and anniversaries are a, a good time to pause and, and to survey the past and take stock. And since this statute was passed two decades ago, we have achieved very encouraging results in the fight against human trafficking. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a serious challenge that is emerging. We live in a digital age, and like everyone else, human traffickers are relying increasingly on digital communications and the internet and platforms like that. And more and more, the evidence we rely on to detect and to deal with these predators is digital evidence. However, increasingly, this evidence is being encrypted. And we all recognize that encryption is important. 
uh, in the commercial world to protect consumers like us from cyber criminals. But now we're seeing military grade encryption being marketed on consumer products like cell phones and and uh, media, social media platforms and messaging services. And this means that we cannot get access to this data. Uh, and uh, we just can't have chat rooms and websites that are involved in grooming children victims or selling trafficked women. Uh, sites that are impenetrable to law enforcement. And um, we have to do something about this. And, Recently, I met with my counterparts in the Five Eyes, you know, Great Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and we've all agreed. And we met with victims groups, we met with the companies, and we tried to impress upon the companies the damage that would be done to our efforts to combat human trafficking unless we can find a solution for this. So we're working together with our foreign partners on this issue. In the meantime, we are committed to combating human trafficking in all its forms and using every tool at our disposal. And I commend the President and Ivanka for all they have done to stop this scourge. Today's event is a very important opportunity to ensure that victims' voices are heard and to send a message that this issue is a top priority of this administration, the whole administration. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to pledge to you that the Department of Justice will do everything in our power to continue bringing human traffickers to justice. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the panelists for our first panel, moderated by Director of the Domestic Policy Council, Joe Grogan. So uh, this is an extraordinary panel, actually, because of the wide range of uh, expertise and perspective that we've got here. We've got uh, tribal, state government affairs, uh, law enforcement at the local level, and people who can share the fight against tr uh, human trafficking and what they're doing from across the spectrum. So I don't want to uh, take too much time with any uh, introductory remarks, but I want to start with uh, the Lieutenant Governor of Florida as we head into Super Bowl weekend. Uh, uh, one thing that has become clear to me in the last uh, few couple years is how big human trafficking is around the uh, Super Bowl. And I wanted to know, uh, and I think the uh, uh, people would be interested in understanding what is the state of Florida doing, what are you doing to combat human trafficking around the Super Bowl, but in Florida generally. Well, good morning, and thank you all for the opportunity to be here. It is such a privilege, and thank you for that question. Uh, Florida has been a leader in many respects with regards to our fight against human trafficking. Uh, certainly an event of the magnitude of the Super Bowl uh, brings its own challenges. Uh, we're excited. Our community is thrilled to host it. Miami puts on a great event, but with that comes a very ugly underworld of human trafficking activity. So what we've been doing in preparation of the Super Bowl is really partnering with our law enforcement at every level, 
local, state, and federal, making sure that we learned from those that held the Super Bowl before us uh, in Atlanta the year prior. Uh, we've got a tremendous collaboration, not just with law enforcement, not just with our healthcare providers, not just with the private sector, but it really truly is a very comprehensive, innovative approach because we want to make sure that those perpetrators that think they're going to come into our uh, state, they're going to prey on our youth, they're going to recognize very quickly that Florida is closed for business, our children are not for sale. So we've been, we've been really working diligently, ensuring that we have all of our partners. Um, I have some great representation from Florida here, our amazing attorney general who's involved as well, and some of our legislative leaders that have championed the cause. And so we have been working morning, noon, and night to ensure that we're ready. Uh, we have partnerships in the private sector with Uber. They have trained over 100,000 Uber drivers, our hotel and restaurant association, our truckers association, uh, making sure our county health departments, emergency management, it really runs the gamut of everything from a state perspective, but again, partnering with the locals, partnering with the nonprofits that are adept at uh, rescue operations and service provision. And so it really has been a comprehensive effort. And might I add that we'll be hosting it yet again in our state um, with Tampa following suit. So they too have been entrenched in the organizational process to make sure that they are ready um, just as well as Miami. Let's stay with the state perspective just for a second, because Chris um, Ivanka mentioned the trip to Atlanta, which I had the privilege of accompanying her on, along with Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar. Uh, it's tremendously impressive to see what uh, George is doing at the governor's level and the senior leadership. I can't, again, speak more highly of what's going on with the uh, nonprofit community in, in Atlanta. But could you speak about why Georgia is stepping forward in, in your in involvement in uh, fighting human trafficking? Absolutely. And we're so grateful that you got the chance to come down and Ivanka got the chance to come down and see Wellspring. You know, when presidents make issues issues, it matters. And I cannot thank President Trump enough for what he has done. And when governors and first ladies make issues issues, it matters. And that's what Governor Brian Kemp and our First Lady Marty Kemp have done before they were even in office. But the first thing the First Lady did was to create the Grace Commission to bring everybody to the table and say, what are we doing? How can we work together? And where do we go from here? And we're laser focused on three issues, training and awareness. And we've, you've heard you have some of the nonprofits that we have here, but you've got the state now going to be training all of its employees. You've got the city of Atlanta focused on this issue. You have our Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. You've got the nonprofits like Street Grace and Out of Darkness and Wellspring, Rotary International that's focused on this issue. But you also have great corporate partners. Just Wednesday, I was at Delta where they're training 86,000 employees to be the eyes in the sky. We've got UPS here that's doing truckers against trafficking because they're in every neighborhood around the world. You've got IHG that's focused on the hotel industry, but we're also fo focused on restoration. And I will tell you, Wellspring Living is the gold standard. And when you see Jessica and you hear her story, and we focus on victim-centered, trauma-informed, evidence-based support. And why? Because these are our brothers and sisters. These are human beings with dignity and value and worth. And I'll, I'll be quick, but you have to go after those who are buying and selling our children for sex. And thanks to, thanks to our governor and our legislature, we now have a human trafficking prosecutions unit in our office because, as the attorney general said, this is happening online. Today they're in South Georgia, tomorrow they're in Atlanta, East Georgia the next day. So we can partner with our three great U.S. attorneys the FBI, our GBI, our DAs, sheriffs, and police chiefs to make sure that we go after them because, and I'm proud, Shared Hope, and we had a C with Shared Hope a couple years ago. We now have an A, and I'm proud because we are focused on the victims. Great. I, I, I would um, just share this little anecdote as, the, as I was getting uh, at the airport in Atlanta after visiting Wellspring, I heard on the uh, PA system in the Delta Terminal for passengers and employees to be on the lookout for 
uh, victims of trafficking. It was, it was uh, kind of a stark uh, example because we had met uh, at Delta at the event and heard about their apprenticeship program, but to see it in action, uh, their commitment to the issue was pretty incredible. And, and so I sure commend that. them. They do it on the train, voice of God, and, and some great messaging as well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to the sheriff for a second because you, you opened the uh, prosecution door, and I'd like to understand uh, from you, Sheriff, what are you doing at the local level? Are, have you seen any changes over the past, uh, over your career, and how we confront this issue? And, well, thank uh, you. Why you're committed to it? Yeah, thank you, and it's a, it's an honor and a privilege privilege to be here with you today. Um, coming from Texas, of course, we have a tenacious governor who's made it resoundingly clear that every level of government, all the way down to the local level, uh, will be involved in the fight to end this scourge. Uh, I want to tell you a story about eight sheriffs in North Texas that banded together uh, in order to uh, fight human trafficking. Uh, when I was elected in 2017, I met with seven other sheriffs in the North Texas area, and we sat down and talked about what are those things that we can do to stem the flow of narcotics and human trafficking across our counties. And what we came up with is, first of all, listen, we understand uh, that what happens here is the very same transnational criminal enterprises and gangs that are trafficking narcotics, these are the people that are trafficking humans. Um, these are the people that are vic continually victimized the drug addict these victims in order to control them. We also understand that as sheriffs, that the one advantage we have is jurisdiction over long pieces of road uh, in our counties. So what we did was is we decided to band together uh, to sign an agreement with one another that extends the jurisdiction of our deputies into each other's counties. You don't see that done very often. And what happened was we took specially trained deputies who were trained to detect those indicators for human trafficking and narcotics, and we turned them loose. And I'm happy to tell you that in just two years, uh, what they've been able to accomplish is they have seized tons of narcotics and dangerous drugs, millions of dollars, weapons and ammunition are being smuggled south, destined for Mexico. They've recovered almost 100 stolen motor vehicles. They've discovered loads of human cargo in commercial motor vehicles, 18-wheelers, and most importantly, they've rescued children. I want to tell you two quick stories about that. Uh, one of our deputies northwest of Fort Worth uh, late at night stopped a vehicle uh, with a 15-year-old girl in the back seat uh, of a vehicle occupied by two middle-aged men who did not know her name. And she did not know theirs. And she had been reported missing by her parents the week before in San Antonio. We had another case in which one of our interdiction deputies out east of Dallas on the interstate made a traffic stop and discovered that the woman driving the car was wanted for capital murder in Los Angeles. He arrested her. There was a five-year-old in the vehicle. She murdered a man two days before in Los Angeles and kidnapped his five-year-old son. And we successfully rescued that child. All of this makes it worth for us. All we have to do is one time look in the face of a human trafficking victim or someone who's sexually exploited uh, and for law enforcement it makes it all all perfect so from the local level what I see is where in the past perhaps you know maybe that county was that sheriff's domain uh, we've decided that that's a day gone by uh, my brother sheriff brother and sister sheriffs across Texas uh, Governor Abbott and the legislature have passed laws uh, that now allow us to work across county lines that are even not contiguous in these types of matters, and we're taking advantage of it, and we're going to continue the good fight on the open road. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, judge Blake, you're a tribal judge in Northern California. I thought maybe you'd share a little bit of how you're interacting with law enforcement and, and fighting the scourge at the tribal level. Certainly, uh, and again, thank you very much for the honor to be here today. I not only am a, 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 an elected judge for, for my tribe, the Hoopa Valley Tribe, located in Northern California, I'm also the president of the National American Indian Court Judges Association, um, the only tribal judges association in the nation. So I speak, on a glo I, I speak on a national level. I don't speak just on behalf of California, but I also speak because I am a parent of a, of a traffic victim myself. Um, my own daughter was trafficked, and when we talk about, I mean, I heard the, the Attorney General talk about the, the use of social media. I, I like to like, I tell people that it, my home is 67 miles from the closest McDonald's and 71 from the closest Walmart. That just gives you an idea how remote we are. 
and how, how a trafficker found my child in remote Humboldt County was through social media and with the dream that she was going to be this model, with this dream that she was going to achieve all these aspirations that she had in her life. The, the idea that you have to be a child that is a foster child, that you have to be a neglected and abused child is not always accurate because this child never wanted for anything. This child was pretty, I mean, as, as we looked back at, at her empty room while she, after she left, we kept thinking what, what we missed. And what, it, what we missed was the encouraging her to be something, to be somebody, to reach those goals, and her wanting to do so and, and being um, falling prey to somebody that is um, offering that service, but not for that purpose. And it, it um, and like I say, so that started my that started my road on this on this issue with trafficking, because one, if it will happen to me as a sitting elected judge, as an as an elected official for tribal communities, I I, I was tasked with providing you know prosecution for this type of stuff, you know, making certain that our children are safe, but yet my own child was able to be uh, was able to uh, walk into the hands of somebody who. Um, takes the innocence away from a child like that. So these, these tribal communities, they're not only remote, they're very, very remote. They're, we, uh, social media is huge in tribal communities So because of the remoteness. And uh, you only look at the number of UPS and FedEx trucks that come into our community. That's the only way you can get things in and out. So again, you know, the training internationally, I mean, nationally, um, as we as we look at as we look um, and finding ways to train you know to train our tribal leaders to train our providers and to, uh, to train our parents on um, the signs of trafficking so that their children are not going to fall prey like mine did. Thank you for that. Amy Loudenbeck, you're a state representative uh, in Wisconsin, and you've authored a number of bills to combat human trafficking. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what drew you to, to this uh, area, and then uh, what you see uh, in, in achieving success, how are, you, how are you doing it among your fellow state representatives? Well, thank you for the question and for the opportunity to be here. Uh, what got me interested was the Shared Hope Report in 2011 when I was first elected, Wisconsin had a D, and we, in my office, decided to team up with our attorney general at the time, J.B. Van Hollen, and do a rigorous review of their recommendations and modernize our statutes, provide the tools for law enforcement. We did an omnibus bill my first session, we did another omnibus bill my second session, focusing on tools for law enforcement, um, the racketeering, uh, procedures, all of those other things, and um, and really managed to, to chip away and raise our grade. Um, then I started to work with our Department of Children and Families, working with some of the federal um, federal standards that were coming down, but to get some data collected to start screening uh, foster youth and, and youth that were referred to CPS for human trafficking. None of that existed, and so the categories, really getting, um, getting that in the wheelhouse so we could get the, um, get the policies and get the data. Um, I also uh, transitioned from that into really looking at vulnerable youth and what we could do to protect vulnerable youth in, um, in Wisconsin, meeting with stakeholders, learning that access to things like work or mental health and shelter if you don't have parents that are willing to support you is impossible. So, you know, I support parents' rights and I understand that good parents are gonna be engaged with their student, but we used to require a work permit until you were 18 in Wisconsin. Now we've rolled that back to 16 for, um, for the reason that, you know, a, a 16 and a 17 year old that is having to choose between supporting themselves by selling themselves for sex or survival sex or other illegal activity, including labor trafficking for low wages, not appropriate work conditions, those things were happening. And so now they can elect to go out and get a job on their own, on their own volition and they don't need to sign a permit and pay 10 bucks so the government can tell them that that's a good thing because you know either a parent can tell them that or they can make that decision for themselves at that point. And so those were some really important things that we looked at. Mental health, same thing. 
If I want to get mental health services in my school, we spend a ton of money putting mental health in schools and trying to support opportunities for these kids to get help. And if you don't have a parent to support you to get that um, that one-on-one -on -one counseling, you're not going to be able to access it. So we created some um, emergency procedures so that for 30 days you could get counseling and find a way through the courts to, to get yourself that access. And so really kind of looking along the spectrum, our score is now a B. Um, we're still looking at the share hope, shared hope recommendations, but we also know that you know Wisconsin is unique as are all states in and how we need to, to look at this. We've also done quite a bit of awareness and partnerships um, that were kind of prompted by legislative action, but really to kind of move the needle as far as you know pushing out the human trafficking resource hotline. That hit was something that involved, once we started to do that, all of the resource providers, all of the protocols from law enforcement needed to come together before we really pushed it out. So it was something that, you know, it was leadership from myself and others, but really kind of encompassed all the boots on the ground people. That was really, really, I think, a, a pivotal piece to, to build off of for future outreach efforts. So what we're doing going forward is continuing to listen and continuing to monitor. Some of that data is just becoming available from the laws that I passed in 2015 and 16 to actually give us something to look at. So that's exciting. Thank you. <laughs> Michael, you're here to give us a little bit of a perspective as a county commissioner. Um, obviously here in the White House, we're focused so much on federal legislation and we interact a lot with governors about how we can partner with them. But two questions. One, what can the federal government do for, for local communities, maybe a little bit better than we're doing now? And uh, what can you do on your own, uh, frankly, to combat this, uh, this scourge? Let me start with the second question first. Um, but first off, thank you for having me here. Um, this is a great, great event. And I'm glad to see so many people here. And I'm honored to be here um, to help fight this heinous, heinous topic. Right? It's just near and dear to my heart, very passionate, and I'm assuming everybody in this room is just as passionate, if not more so. Um, but we, from a county level, you know, a couple years back, we formed a task force, you know, because you see a lot of people back then in, in the local levels talking about it, and a lot of the comments, it's not in my backyard, it's not here, even at the elected official level at the counties. It's like, that's not true, right? It's everywhere. It doesn't, as many people said here, it affects everybody. It's in everybody's backyard you just don't know about it it's most likely right in front of your face and you don't see it so we form the task force and task force includes you know, every different level of local government from the prosecutor's office to the sheriff's department you know we even have state level on that task force and one of the first things we want to do is create a website where does everybody go because people were once we formed this task force people were coming out of the woodwork you know these small groups these church groups these local groups saying hey how can we help do you have anybody that can help, come help educate us? So you had so many small groups and they didn't necessarily have the resources, which is something the federal government could help with, um, to do some things, to battle some things, to educate, to bring in speakers, um, bring in people to talk about this topic. You know, so we put everybody together and once we formed the website, we also put a hotline in there. You know, we attached to the national hotline, but we created our own hotline because one of the questions that comes up is, how does this affect our county? But from a data perspective, there's, there's general numbers out there. If you, you know, Ivanka mentioned some numbers from a, a national level, and some of the states have numbers. But if you go down to the county level or the local level, it's very difficult to say the true effect of that. You see news, you know, the Sheriff's Department in Oakland County has done a great job. You know, we've uh, a couple different raids with local, not only in Oakland County, but surrounding communities in our Wayne counties in the Tri-County area in Michigan. And we've had numerous amounts of busts both on labor trafficking and sex trafficking. So now that all this is starting to come to light, people are starting to see it, the press has actually taken um, point of it and actually starting to report on it. I'm hoping they report on this today, you know, because there's a lot of good activity going up here. And then to be straightforward, I'm gonna steal half the ideas that you guys put out here today <laughs> because I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not shy. I don't need to have my idea or the, t or the task force idea. You know, if there's a great idea, it's a great idea. You know, I also flew through the Atlanta airport to get here today, and I heard the same thing. I'm taking that back with me and going to our, our international airport, and I'm going to push to have that done because these are all good things to help people out there. Awareness is the number one thing. You know, education. How do we get the information on how people can help people out there? 
Because that's what this is all about. Help people helping people. So let's get the word out. And from a federal government standpoint, you know, the more education, the more information we can help push out there nationally would help. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> on, on that vein about awareness, I do want to make sure before I forget uh, to give the National Human Trafficking Hotline number out because uh, this is a number that should be uh, posted in many places. It should be mentioned whenever we're discussing this subject so that people who uh, uh, need help can reach out and try and get resources. And the number is 1-888-373-7888. And I think it's important, uh, as you said, uh, events like this, even just to begin a discussion about it. I mean, it's, it's great working in the Trump administration with so many committed people, but people like Ivanka who can who uh, can plunge into an issue like this, dive into the substance, raise awareness, and use her, her platform, uh, as well as the Attorney General and so many others. So on the state and local level, are you seeing, any of you seeing an increase in awareness on the subject and, and reports of uh, you know, both the, the incidents, the crime incidents, but also people reaching out? And maybe we could, we could start with uh, Florida. Absolutely. As many here in this room know, Florida ranks third in terms of calls to the national hotline. That number had a huge increase from 2007 to 2015. As of 2016, the numbers started to stabilize, but I also believe that awareness, um, just the vigilance of our community has really come into play. And so as we continue to, to really delve into the messaging, um, again, our county health departments all 67 of our county health departments have participated with HHS in the Look Beneath the Surface campaign. Our Department of Education, the first in the nation, has released a rule. We've implemented curriculum. Each of our school districts is going to be, in an age-appropriate manner, requiring our children to be educated on the ills, the evils of human trafficking. <laughs> Our statewide council on human trafficking, which is led by our attorney general, uh, continues to find ways to develop creative uh, solutions with law enforcement and other partners in the fight. This is truly a battle. And what I continue to stress each and every day, and the Super Bowl has given us a great platform to do it, but what I continue to stress is that this is a problem that we are plagued with 365 days a year, and each and every one of us can make a difference. Judge Blake, do you want to? Yeah. Um, so one of the one of the things is is that as we talk about this, the we're seeing an increase in reporting in Indian country because one, I think that you know the the information's out there, you know the the giving of the uh, of the hotline, I think is is critical. But the other with the uh, the president's. Um, Position on missing, um, murdered in indig of indigenous women. That that was a that was a real, a, a real uh, you know uh, aha moment for Indian country. And it's giving people the opportunity to come forward to say that they were victims of trafficking. And we're seeing it more and more that these children that were missing for years that we thought just were runaways were now coming back and telling us, no, I was li I was living a life that I had no choice to live but to survive. So that, that there again, I, I think that, you know, the continued efforts when you, you were talking about the funding part of that, you know, and in, in be inclusive of, of tribal land because it's not that we don't want to be involved. It's that I think that the invitation needs to be more formally given and we will be there. Great. Thank you. I, <clears throat> certainly uh, tribal issues and tribal engagement is something that we, this administration, uh, really wants to lean in on. We have a dedicated person in our intergovernmental affairs office, uh, totally devoted to tribal issues. And on this, when the president, uh, specifically to traffic, trafficking, when the president signs an executive order later on today, it's important to note that there will be a uh, new position created at the D Domestic Policy Council solely devoted to fighting human trafficking. So we're very excited about that. That, that person, while they'll be in the Domestic Policy Council, and, and consistent with the way the President runs his White House, will be working cross-functionally with anybody and any agency who wants to fight this issue. It's Ivanka's team, it's the National Economic Council, 
it's the National Security Council, it's anybody uh, who wants to step forward and volunteer to help because this is a, a huge problem that requires all of government, including our, our international partners. It's great to see uh, Ambassador Brownback, uh, our two wonderful ambassadors in the front row here. Uh, and I just want to say from a personal perspective how uh, deeply moving it is for me to work on these issues. Domestic Policy Council covers a whole host of issues, but I don't know that uh, I have ever been around um, any, any issue that uh, is both as emotional and as difficult, or, but as inspiring as fighting human trafficking. I want to thank especially the, the survivors who've uh, made it here today and who have uh, come here on numerous occasions who volunteered to give us advice to step forward and share their stories because without you, uh, we wouldn't be able to get anything done and get any traffic, any uh, momentum going on this. So thank you very much to our panel and to everybody for coming here today. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Ambassador Callista Gingrich. Good morning. It's an honor to be here. I want to thank President Trump and Senior Advisor Ivanka Trump for their leadership and steadfast commitment to the fight against human trafficking. The scourge of human trafficking is a stain on all of humanity. It invades borders, destroys communities, and robs millions of their human dignity. Faced with this great challenge, the Trump administration is committed to protecting survivors, prosecuting offenders, and ending modern day slavery. However, governments cannot act alone. Human trafficking is a global crisis and requires global solutions across all sectors of society. Partnerships with faith-based organizations are critical in turning the tide. Faith-based organizations serve as lifelines for some of the most vulnerable people on the planet, including victims of human trafficking. They have an unrivaled ability to build trust with survivors and to provide care and rehabilitation. Like the United States, the Holy See understands and appreciates the powerful role of faith-based organizations in eradicating modern-day slavery. Indeed, Catholic organizations are among some of America's best partners in this endeavor. The U.S. Embassy to the Holy See works with the global network of the Catholic Church, which extends to more than 1.3 billion people worldwide. For example, as an embassy, we promote and support the courageous work of Catholic sisters. Our grants have funded anti-trafficking programs for women religious in 36 countries. Recently, we established an anti-trafficking training course for a global organization called Talitha Kum. Talitha Kum is comprised of over 2,000 Catholic sisters in 92 countries, all working to combat human trafficking. Faith-based organizations like Talitha Kum are on the ground in nearly every country in the world, including the United States. They work tirelessly to save women, men, and children from horrific fates. And they are key partners for federal and state law enforcement agencies braving the omnipresent threat of criminal and terrorist organizations that profit from this global crime. Together, law enforcement agencies and faith-based organizations help facilitate victim recovery, reintegration, and criminal prosecution. Here in the United States, the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI have strong partnerships with Catholic service organizations to provide safe havens for victims. And internationally, the United States and the Holy See are members of the Santa Marta Group, an organization comprised of law enforcement officials, 
Catholic bishops, women religious, and civil society leaders that work together to develop victim-centered approaches to end human trafficking. As you leave today with renewed dedication and resolve, I encourage you to explore opportunities to collaborate with faith-based organizations across all faiths in the fight against modern-day slavery. In this regard, the U.S. Embassy to the Holy See will continue to work diligently with the Vatican to eradicate human trafficking. Together, we can save lives and end this horrific injustice. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage the panelists for our second panel, moderated by Ambassador at Large, Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons, John Richmond. Well, this morning we do have uh, the incredible privilege of hearing from several members of Congress, uh, leaders who have helped create the massive shift in the legal landscape around the world, um, establishing a comprehensive trafficking in persons law or Trafficking Victims Protection Act, the 20th anniversary of which is this year, which is what is bringing us all together. It defined human trafficking uh, to include both labor trafficking as well as sex trafficking. It includes trafficking offenses against children and adults. Um, it makes sure that we're thinking about both domestic and international trafficking and dispels some common myths, uh, like the idea that trafficking involves the movement of people. It doesn't require the movement. It just requires coercion. Um, this, is a, th this is a crime that there's something we can do about. I'm grateful that the, the law gave us the three P paradigm that we still use today, this idea of prosecution, protection, and prevention. Uh, three inextricably um, important and mutually reinforcing ideas that help us in this fight. So with this incredible panel, uh, let me uh, start with uh, Congressman Smith. Uh, Congressman, you were one of the earliest champions of a, the bill, and you introduced the bill that ultimately became the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. I'd love for you to tell us what was going on in the late 90s. What prompted you to be an early champion of this work? And how has the Trafficking in Persons report that was created and mandated by the law that you helped um, champion uh, making an impact around the world? Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so very much. And thank you for so faithfully implementing the law and doing above and beyond uh, what was even articulated in the statute and statutes that followed. You know, in, in, I've been in Congress now 40 years. And in 1982, I introduced my first anti-trafficking resolution targeted at the Soviet Union. Uh, the use of gulag labor there was horrific. Commissioner Ron Robb, who was then the Customs Commissioner, uh, had a number of products that he wanted to put an import ban on. Uh, so I did a resolution that passed uh, in the House. Uh, a few years later, Frank Wolf and I went to Perm Camp 35, the infamous gulag where such great people like Dayton Sharansky had spent so many years of their life. But again, the gulag system was all over the Soviet Union and exporting of those products was occurring. <laughs> a couple years later, after Tiananmen Square, Frank Wolf and I again went to a prison camp in China and saw 40 Tiananmen Square activists under the false banner of reform through labor, forced labor, uh, be making goods that came to our markets, including jelly shoes, which were very popular then, socks. We came back with samples, got an import ban on that. A couple of years later, uh, in 1996, I introduced comprehensive legislation on child labor. Uh, and unfortunately, it had the same template that we put into the TPVA, and that is name names and then uh, sanction those countries that either do not enforce a law or if they don't have a law at all on child labor. I had Kathy Lee Gifford testify at one of the hearings. She had products in Central America uh, that were unfortunately the result of child labor being sold in our stores. Next, two years later, we got the, the bill passed in the House, failed in the Senate, never took it up. 
Uh, great people like Michael Horowitz came into my office. We had great meetings. What an advocate he is and was uh, for human trafficking. Uh, my staffers, uh, uh, David Abramowitz on the Democrat side, and uh, Joseph Reese, who uh, was our first ambassador uh, to East Timor. Uh, we worked on legislation to finally say, enough. We're going to combat trafficking here, overseas. We will also make it a whole of government so nobody is excluded in the government. Uh, and have real penalties up to life imprisonment for anybody who exploits uh, a child and anybody through force, fraud, or coercion uh, harbors, uh, hurts a woman or a man. But sex trafficking is obviously uh, one of the major focuses. As Kalitza said so, are, so well, you know, there are about 5 million women, uh, and mostly women and children, who are sex trafficked, about 20 million, according to the ILO, who are trafficked uh, uh, because of, of labor. And of course, there's an intermingling so very often. Uh, but the legislation was very hard to get passed. The previous administration then uh, did not want the TIP report, which you do great work in putting together so that the three Ps, the narrative on each and every country, says how they're doing on prevention, prosecution, and protection, with a set of recommendations <laughs> that follow as well. Um, they said, yes, put it into the human rights report, the country reports on human rights practices. Would have, would, which would have been a step. We said, absolutely not. My friend over here, uh, Sam Brownback, <laughs> took the bill up on the Senate side, his own bill, and we, we did a merge purge at the end. Uh, but it was, it was against serious odds. That administration did not want to have sanctions. Sanctions are embedded in the bill, as you know so well. It covers everything, uh, and it's making a difference. There were times when the TIP report was less than stellar, 2015 in particular. Uh, but you have done a magnificent job. It is the gold standard. And I know for a fact, because you do as well, we, we meet with delegations all the time. They don't want to be on tier three. They don't want to be shamed uh, for their egregious complicity in human trafficking, sex or labor. Uh, and they want to be above that. Plus, there's the sanctions piece. So I want to thank you again for what you have done. There's so much more to be done. Finally, government, government. Government to the NGOs, and the NGOs have been indispensable in all of this. Kalitza, uh, uh, Secretary, or I should say Ambassador uh, Gingrich, thank you uh, for the faith-based emphasis you have made, because that, I think, is indispensable uh, to ending this terrible plague. <laughs> and we've had Delta Airlines testify at hearings. We've had what, they're doing a tremendous job. But the private partnership now, you know, I just yesterday, uh, Deb, who was here, uh, she did a tremendous work, it is doing a tremendous work, as is Homeland Security, on training people to be situationally aware. Uh, R.W. Uh, um, Barnabas and uh, uh, Hackensack uh, Meridian, two large networks in my state, are training their health care workers. And we know from the 2014 Laura Letterer study, and I'll finish on this, uh, they've, they've made it very clear that 90% of all the victims of sex trafficking go to a health care facility. 63% go to an emergency room. So if you have health care professionals who are situationally aware, and we need to share this as, as you are with other overseas uh, partners as well, there is a point of contact for victim identification, God willing, intervention, and then on th to the road to recovery. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your, your passion about this. Thank you for using the TIP report and your engagement you. and with other countries. I hear as I travel um, other countries talking about the importance when members of Congress raise this on their congressional outreach to other countries, so I'm grateful for that. Um, and you might uh, be uh, encouraged to know there are original members of the Trafficking in Persons Office here today that opened uh, the office when it first started based on the act. Um, and as you mentioned, I know that uh, you had allies in the Senate. Um, and Ambassador Brownback, you are certainly one of those as you uh, brought this bill forward on the Senate side. Um, I would, and now I get to work alongside you uh, at the State Department in your new role um, as Ambassador at Large for Religious Freedom. And I'm grateful for your, uh, for your wise counsel uh, during my time at the State Department. I've certainly benefited from, from working with you. But I'd love to know um, what motivated you and what were your thoughts as you began to think about the Trafficking in Persons Act um, from the Senate perspective? Um, how have you seen it be used? What are we doing well and what do we need to do differently? Um, how do we need to adjust as we're moving into the future? <clears throat> well, 
I saw something and then decided you need to do something, which I'm, my guess is my story is pretty similar to most people in this room. You see it, something clicks and you say, well, somebody needs to do something, and then you turn back and you look at yourself, well, I need to do something. <laughs> Uh, and did it. Gary Haugen showed up at my office when he was heading the uh, IJM, which I believe he still is. I don't know if Gary's here or not. Uh, and he laid a lock on my uh, coffee table. And he said this was taken off of a brothel in India, off of a room where a 12-year-old girl was locked in here, uh, and then the lock was taken off when a customer would come, and she was locked in there at night. Uh, and this continues to go on, and it goes on a great deal. Uh, I had a great staff member, Sharon Pate, uh, at the time that was really working this issue, and we formed a partnership with Paul Wellstone, mm -hmm. who uh, he and Sheila, his wife, were uh, both involved in this, and they were seeing women being trafficked from the Ukraine into, into uh, Minnesota. Uh, and they were showing up then at battered women's shelters and saying, what are you doing here from the Ukraine? Well, it's kind of a long story, but let me tell you about it and did, and together we formed a partnership, and behind and on that partnership also, the private sector, uh, was, uh, uh, gosh, we had G Gloria Steinem uh, on that, uh, Chuck Colson, and we would go around to other members in the Senate and say, we've got Gloria Steinem and Chuck Colson on this bill, and Paul Wellstein and I are doing this, and they'd say, just sign me up, I don't care what's in it. I, if, if you guys agree on this, uh, we'll, we'll go forward. But that's really the point of it. This is an issue that just knows no political boundary. Yeah. Uh, this is a complete human dignity issue about mm -hmm. somebody that's just been put in a, a horrific circumstance and condition. And being from the state of Kansas, and I have my Kansas City Chiefs socks on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, my mother grew up on the property where John Brown uh, would stay when he was in Kansas during the Bleeding Kansas. We're fighting against slavery in those very early days. And I'm looking at that heritage and saying, I've got to be a part to end this modern slavery, just like you've said that to yourself. Well, I'm certainly grateful, and I appreciate you highlighting the bipartisan nature of this bill as it's gone through. And as one thing we've seen over the last 20 years is that there has been a grand consensus across the political aisle regarding uh, this important issue. I'm grateful that the two of you put together this law, this comprehensive law that focuses on both labor and sex trafficking, gave us great tools about how we could approach nonviolent coercion to address how traffickers are actually operating in modern times and give us great tools like the T-Visa and other tools that we can use to make sure that victims are protected. Um, let, let me shift uh, to Congressman McCall. Um, you have served as uh, the chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee. Now you're the lead Republican on the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, you're working both domestically as well as internationally on this. I know you've just proposed a new piece of legislation, the Leveraging Information for Foreign, Foreign Traffickers Act, the LIFT Act, I think it's being called. We'd love to hear more about that and how you see the role of the U.S. Advisory Council and survivors um, that are here today, but also survivors around the country and around the world, and how they speak into this issue. What needs to be done as we look into the future? Well, thank you, Ambassador, and thanks for having me, and thanks for your service, and Ambassador, and um, uh, Congressman Ted Poe, who was on Foreign Affairs, did so much on trafficking issues. It's good to see you again. Um, I think my journey started as a federal prosecutor. Uh, for about 10 years, and then uh, Cornyn's deputy attorney general, we started the Internet Crimes Against Children uh, unit to catch predators online. And there have been thousands of prosecutions in my state putting these uh, predators behind bars. And that's a, that's a real positive thing. That was back in 2002, but since I became chairman, when I was chairman of Homeland, uh, we had the blue campaign in the Department of Homeland Security. I see some out in the audience, we authorized that into law uh, to raise public awareness on the issue because what we found is that most people in the country were not even aware this was happening. And it happens not just in Thailand, it, it's happening in our own backyard. And I want to uh, recognize uh, Courtney Litvak, my human trafficking survivor, who came back to us a year ago, uh, who has a special place in my heart and a special story uh, to tell because. Um, you have to hear these stories. This happened outside of Houston, Texas, in the suburbs of Houston and Katy, Texas. If it could happen in Katy, Texas, it can happen anywhere in the nation.
And so the Blue Campaign has done a great job coordinating with law enforcement, public awareness. Uh, the other bill is the interdic Interdiction for the Protection of Children, which takes my uh, DPS, my Texas DPS model, where you know a lot of these troopers make the traffic stops. But if they don't know how to identify the warning signs that, hey, this is not this girl's father, or something's in that car that doesn't really make sense. And they have a training program that we want to take nationwide with a grant a funding component to it so that we can capture and arrest these, these evil monsters you know, and get them off the streets. Finally, the LIFT Act, leveraging information on foreign trafficking. Believe it or not, in our embassies and our consulate offices, when they deny a visa for, um, based on human trafficking, they do not share that information with law enforcement. It's just tucked away in a file. So this would mandate that information be shared with law enforcement. But what I'm also proud, and this goes back to now the, the council, mm -hmm. is we authorize uh, the uh, President's Advisory Council to the year 2025. Why is that important? Because I think, that, I want to give Ivanka a shout out as well. She's really elevated this issue and prioritized this issue. We want to do a lot. We want to make this council really mean something, not only for the executive branch, but for policymakers in the Congress so we can get the advice. And I've learned so much from just Courtney about the process and how it works. How could a beautiful 17-year-old girl get swept up, and I can't say where because there's an ongoing investigation, but how could this have happened? Uh, it really makes no sense. And to get these stories and have victims and survivors on the, the council I think it's very valuable uh, to Congress and to the executive branch. As we approach the Super Bowl, I know you're going to that, you know that's going to be a major trafficking event. And there are going to be groomers all around the Super Bowl trying to trap young men and women into this horrific modern day slavery. And we all know the stories and you're bought and sold like property. Uh, this needs to stop and as a former prosecutor, I try to educate prosecutors and judges too. You know what? The victims are the victims. They don't deserve to be behind bars. It's the predators. Mm. It's the people yeah. taking the yeah. And they need to be behind bars for a very, very long time. No, uh, no, I so appreciate you highlighting both the role of the Advisory Council and the fact that you're trying to extend its life in the LIFT Act. Um, the Council has been so valuable to me personally and I think it's been valuable to the administration um, as well. Um, and I also hope that, uh, that folks hear the message that you're saying about the principle of non-prosecution of victims, that victims should not be prosecuted or penalized in any way for the unlawful acts their traffickers make them engage in. I think that's a really important point. Uh, let, let, let me shift to, to Congressman, Congresswoman Wagner. Um, during your time in Congress, you've been incredibly focused on online um, exploitation of, of women and children as well as, as men. I, I know that you're personally interested in some of the work in the Philippines. I know the State Department has a robust child protection compact with the Philippines where the Philippines put skin in the game along with our foreign assistance where we work together in order to actually stop traffickers and protect victims. Love to hear your perspective on what is going well and what needs to change as we move forward. Great, great. Thank you, Ambassador Rivers. And I'm going to stand up. I've got a long flight ahead of me and uh, uh, stretch my legs for a minute. But it's, and I want to see all the survivors, all the NGOs, all the advocacy groups uh, that just lift us up to be here on the 20th anniversary of TVPA, uh, Chris Smith. Uh, my, you know, my ranking member, uh, 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 Mike Call and, and Ted Poe, I, you know, I, I stand on your shoulders. This is only my eighth year in Congress, not 40th, eighth year in Congress. <laughs> and um, I, I, the TVPA is, is so important. I, I got really passionate about uh, human trafficking and, um, and labor trafficking trafficking that was going on, sex trafficking and labor trafficking, doing my very first tip report as a U.S. ambassador in Western Europe. And uh, I was watching uh, women and children and young boys being brought in from Eastern Europe and being exploited in Western Europe in horrific, horrific ways. And um, 
you know, served my, my, my time and went back to the United States of America and began to dig into this in my own backyard, in my own country, and found that, yes, indeed, that human trafficking, and specifically sex trafficking, was hiding in plain sight mm -hmm. in every community, in every faith organization, in every cul-de-sac, in every school district, um, all across our country, and that it was a scourge and something that we absolutely had to do something about. The, the, I, I tell you what you all are doing with the TIP report in terms of the, um, the compact is fantastic in the Philippines mm -hmm. and online. Uh, it, it's been expanded, I know, to Peru and Ghana, Jamaica. I want to see it grow so uh, more and more. But my passion is to, to, to go after those predators online. I'm probably best known for the authorship and the passing of FOST, the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. Yes, yes. You all know you were there. They said it couldn't be done, and we did it. Uh, you know, it was um, a, a life's work, I, yeah, I have to say, it truly is, it, to be able to give tools and resources to our law enforcement and prosecutors that, that allow them to go through the sex trafficking statutes and the prostitution statutes to fight this criminal enterprise. It allows, it allows justice for our victims at last, and it did something they said could never be done which was to go in, and, and uh, Congressman Poe knows, to go in and amend the Communications Decency Act, Section uh, 230, uh, to make it, it, Congress's intent very, very clear. We never met through the CDA to make the internet an off red light district. If it is a crime offline, it is a crime online. <laughs> period, full stop. So, we have, it's been now, gosh, President Trump, and with the help of Ivanka and so many others, uh, the president signed this into law in, in April of 2018. So it's been about a year and a half, and the disruption has been amazing um, in a good way. Uh, we brought down Backpage.com with a 93 count indictment. <laughs> Over 60% of, uh, many just, just pulled down their internet sites uh, as a deterrent factor, which is what we knew it would do for fear of prosecution. But we've disrupted over 60% year to year. A lot of what's being posted right now are, are kind of um, uh, duplicates and spam and scam type of, of things. But you can go to uh, childsafe.ai, childsafe.ai, to see some of the, of the inroads that we've made over this, this uh, time, time period here. So I'm excited about uh, that work and, and what you all did to make that happen. And my next. Crusade is end-to-end -end encryption. And I know the Attorney General talked about it, yes. And we talked about it, Ambassador, at our DHS uh, conference. You know, I had, and I'm just gonna call it out because uh, as Kevin and others know, I just do. And uh, I had the opportunity at a hearing in financial services to uh, uh, speak and question uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, Facebook. 90% uh, of the online sexual, pornographic, horrific, exploitive images are on Facebook and their platforms. 12 million, in fact, in 2018. And to, their, and to, and to, and, and, uh, to say something positive, at the time, they reported those 12 million. They reported those 12 million horrific, awful images. But now, they're going to move to end-to-end -to -end encryption. And when they do that, law enforcement will not be able to access any of those images. And with impunity, uh, after letters and, and pleadings from the Attorney General, from the Department of Homeland Security, from law enforcement, from prosecutors, from DAs, from me, Congress, others, um, they refuse. They want to go move forward on their end-to-end -end encryption. So we're, if, if an industry won't police itself, that's when Congress steps in. And we're going to police them, that's for sure. You know, and, and this is important, privacy and lawful access are not pitted against each other. Privacy and lawful access are not pitted against each other. The Fourth Amendment gives us a lot of broad privacy rights, but you know what, it's not warrantless, all right? And uh, we have to have a way to make sure that people's privacies, privacy is protected 
but that also law enforcement has a way to keep our children, our women, the most vulnerable in our society safe. That's what we're going to do with this legislation. So that's where we're going next. I thank you for the time. I thank you all for what you do. We all stand on your shoulders and are grateful for the, the advocacy group uh, work. My, my great staffer, Rachel Wagley, back there, about ready to give birth any minute now. Uh, uh, she uh, helps author so much of what goes on here. Um, I'm just grateful to you. I'm grateful to our State Department and uh, for the TIP report. And what you're doing online now with the compact is really great, and I want to see it expanded. So I thank you. Thank you. Well, I can't tell you how much a treat it is for me to actually reverse roles. I'm used to getting asked questions by members of Congress, and now I get to actually uh, ask you all. So um, it's a treat for me. I, I can tell you that um, a lot has been accomplished on the Hill, um, and we're grateful for the legislation that's been provided. Um, shortly after the Trafficking Victims Act uh, became law in 2000, the United Nations passed its protocol against trafficking in persons. And um, I'm grateful today that um, the head of the United Nations Trafficking in Persons program is actually here with us. Grateful for your partnership over the years and look forward to continuing to combat this uh, w with you. Uh, it's one of the most widely adopted international protocols. There's over 175 countries that have signed up. Uh, there's only about 15 to 18 countries that haven't, which is, is just remarkable. Um, and since then, we've had um, over 150 governments around the world have followed the United States and passed trafficking in persons laws, comprehensive laws. Um, and we're so grateful for that, to have this international legal consensus that human trafficking is wrong, that it's a violation, that people are putting freedom first which is the phrase that the president has given to this year, that we want to put freedom first. We want to put it first in our priorities, in our conversations. We want to raise it with other countries. We want to raise it with each state in this union and make sure we're doing well. Because while we recognize it's the 20th anniversary and we want to celebrate what's been accomplished, we also know that there is a great deal left to be done. And the 24.9 million victims around the world are evidence of that. It is our job now to take the parchment promises of law and turn them into tangible deeds that bring hope to individuals who need rescue and need services. And we want to make sure that we do that. And we want to make sure that we hold traffickers accountable, that we end the impunity that traffickers currently enjoy. I can tell you that this is hard work. There are not easy answers. They're not simple solutions. But the world is not in desperate need of more people to explain to us why these things are hard. The world's in desperate need of more people to do the hard things. And I'm grateful that you all are here and willing to do those hard things, to secure freedom for individuals who are currently being trafficked and to put freedom first. We're grateful to this administration's focus on freedom first. Thankful that we get to work together with this White House, with Congress, with so many civil society leaders. I see so many uh, NGOs and leaders here from across the movement. We're grateful for your presence here today. Um, and we're grateful that as you leave here, you're going to receive a, um, a commemorative book of the last 20 years that highlights the history of what has gone on um, here in the United States, um, how the act was formed, early stories from Congressman Smith and Ambassador Brownback about their days along with their colleagues from both sides of the aisle. Um, it's a retrospective of what has been accomplished and really a call to each of us that as we pivot into the future, we have to do more. That what we've accomplished so far um, is not sufficient. There is more to be done. And I'm grateful that we get to be in this fight together. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Please. Thank you. And I want to thank you all for being here as we mark the 20th anniversary of Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Very important. 20 years ago, this nation took a historic step to protect the victims of this form of modern-day slavery here in the United States and all around the world. My administration is 100 percent committed to eradicating human trafficking from the Earth I am pleased to be joined this afternoon by Vice President Mike Pence and the members of my cabinet, Attorney General William Barr, Secretary Jean Scalia. Hello, Jean. Secretary Alex Azar, who's very busy, and I'm going to see you in a little while, right? 
unfortunately for this, uh, in this case, Acting Secretary Chad Wolf. Great job with those numbers. Great job, Chad. Deputy Secretary Stephen Begun. Hi, Stephen. And thanks also to Representatives Chris Smith, Ann Wagner, Michael McCall, and Chip Roy for being with us. Thank you very much. And we have a lot of great senators that wanted to be here so desperately, but I said, just stay where you are and do your job, please. <laughs> we also have with us Ambassadors Callista Gingrich. Hi, Callista. <laughs> Sam Brownback and John Richmond. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Director of the FBI, Christopher Ray. Christopher. Thank you, Chris. And we have uh, Georgia Attorney General Chris Carr, very active. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much. And Florida Attorney General Ashley Moody. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. Florida Lieutenant Governor Jeanette Nunes. And First Lady of Texas, Cecilia Abbott. I just saw your husband, by the way. I just saw your great husband, great gentleman, and North Carolina Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Great. And I'm especially grateful to Ivanka for her unwavering efforts. She has taken this under her wing. Thank you very much. Thank you, honey. Ivanka has been a champion for administrative and legislative actions to combat human trafficking and a true heart. She has uh, — this issue has been so important to her. This and making sure people are ready to work. And she's now created over 15 million jobs for the people of our country. One of the reasons our unemployment numbers are the best ever. 15 million. And I would say that this issue may be closest to our heart because of the level of evil that you would never believe is even possible in a modern age. It, the level of evil is incredible. So I want to just thank Ivanka for, for both of the things that you're really focused on. Thank you very much, honey. Appreciate it. Fifteen million jobs. It was going to be 500,000. Daddy, I think we can do 500,000 within about a week. She broke that, and now she's up to 15 million jobs. It's, it's a fantastic thing. Not, I'm not surprised, Mike. We're not surprised. We're also honored to have with us several extraordinary survivors of human trafficking. And I want to thank you all for being here. And you'll come up when we sign. And uh, it's going to be my great honor to say hello and shake your hand. And your courage really inspires us all. I want to just let you know that. As the men and women in this room know, human trafficking is a problem everywhere, a worldwide problem. Human trafficking is worse than ever before, and that's because of the Internet. I've heard from Bill Barr, and I've heard from others, that uh, the Internet has caused lots of good things to happen and lots of really bad things, and this is probably the worst of the bad things, and uh, it's an incredible thing. An estimated 25 million people around the world today are being held captive, manipulated, and abused by human traffickers. In 2018 alone, the National Human Trafficking Hotline identified over 23,000 human trafficking victims in the United States. Sixty-five percent of these victims were women. More than one in five were children. Human traffickers prey on their most vulnerable citizens and people. They're vicious. They're violent. My administration is fighting these monsters, persecuting and prosecuting them and locking them away for a very, very long time. We've had a tremendous track record, the best track record in a long time. We are dismantling the criminal organizations that make large-scale human trafficking possible. In my first month in office, I instructed federal agencies to go out and just do what you have to do. All federal departments are doing what they do to identify and destroy these groups, and we are destroying a lot of them. Unfortunately, they come back very quickly in a different form. In 2018, the Department of Justice shut down the leading site for online sex trafficking. The DOJ prosecuted a number 
of violent crimes. That now is a record number. In the last three years, ICE has arrested over 5,000 human traffickers, and I want to thank ICE. They have been incredible. These are great, great people. Great, great people. They're tough, they're brave, and they love our country. Overseas, we've also seen historic pro — really, progress, incredible progress, working with us and using our intelligence with them. When I took office, ISIS controlled over 20,000 square miles of territory and perpetrated some of the most heinous forms of human trafficking anywhere in the world. As you know, we've totally defeated the ISIS caliphate in Syria and Iraq, and it's 100 percent. We have thousands and thousands of prisoners, ISIS prisoners, and uh, it's really been something that's been rather incredible, and we did that rather quickly, because when we came in as an administration, it was all over, and we have 100 percent of the caliphate. They're bloodthirsty. They're horrible. The founder and leader, al-Baghdadi, who was trying to rebuild ISIS, is now dead. We got him, and that was a big thing. That was a big thing and not an easy thing. He was hiding, and they've been after him for 15 years, but we got him. My administration is putting unprecedented pressure on traffickers at home and abroad, and we are freeing innocent victims at every single turn. I was proud to be the first Commander-in-Chief to attend a meeting of the President's Interagency Task Force established by the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000. In November, I was also the first President to sign an executive order to establish a task force on missing and murdered American Indians and Alaska Natives. Just signed it. And this has a very special focus on women and girls. That's an incredible thing that's been happening, but we just signed it. I've signed nine pieces of bipartisan legislation aimed specifically at combating human trafficking domestically and around the globe. And in 2018, I signed legislation strengthening the Department of Homeland Security's Blue Campaign, which unified the Department's fight against this crisis and increasing public awareness every single day. We have signed more legislation on human trafficking by far than any other administration has even thought about. We enacted bills. Thank you. And we'll do what's necessary. We will do exactly what's necessary. There's nothing more horrible than this. We enacted bills to fight sex trafficking, increase support for survivors, and raise the standards by which we judge whether other countries are meeting their duty to fight human trafficking. And you have countries that talk, and they talk. They're like politicians in Washington. They keep talking. They do nothing about it. They do nothing about it. And we spend a lot of money on these other countries, and we're not sending it, and we let them know if they're not going to be doing their job. They don't, in some cases, probably want to do their job, and that's a pretty bad thing. We've authorized $430 million to fight sex and labor trafficking. And with the help of the State Department, I have held foreign governments accountable for failing to address human trafficking by imposing restrictions on foreign assistance and very powerful restrictions. I've also prioritized increasing funding for anti-trafficking efforts in my 2021 budget, allocating $70 million toward enhanced prosecutions and at the Department of Justice, we are spending $123 million towards supporting state and local efforts. And this is all new funding, and these funds will directly benefit those on the front lines who are tasked with bringing down the perpetrators of this terrible crime. So the kind of money we're talking about now is far greater than what you've had in the past. And uh, let them give the people that work so hard in this administration credit, because they've wanted to do it more than the people in any other preceding administration. And you can read what you want, you can say what you want, but nobody has done more than what we've been doing on human trafficking. Yeah. 
So today, on the last day of this year's National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month, I will take another very decisive action. In a few moments, I'll sign an executive order targeting human trafficking and child exploitation all across our country. This order — and this is a very big one — this order will build on an incredible work that — and really the unbelievable work that so many of the people in this room have been doing. And all of the work that's been done and increasingly uh, is being done, you wouldn't believe the level — the level of enthusiasm that people working on this issue have. I, I have many issues — economic, we have all different issues. I have never seen such enthusiasm for a single issue as I have for human trafficking. And I have to say, that starts with Bill Barr and Chris Wray, the FBI. It starts with all of the people in law enforcement. So important. And it's uh, something that uh, people really do appreciate. So they collect and they coordinate. They share vital law enforcement and intelligence information with other places all over the world. And very, very important. And we have made a tremendous impact. The problem is it's so massive. It's so many people. It's so many countries. But we've had a tremendous impact. It will be posted online along with a comprehensive list of government resources, all of the things that we do and where to go to find out about what's happening. This order expands prevention education programs, promotes housing opportunities for survivors, and prioritizes the removal of child sexual abuse material from the Internet. And furthermore, it takes the vital step of designating a full-time position here at the White House dedicated solely to combating human trafficking, so people know how important it is. The United States government continues to work with the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, New Zealand in consultation with industry on a set voluntary principle. We have a uh, a set of voluntary principles to tackle online child sexual exploitation and abuse. And the level of detail, the kind of things that they're putting in, nobody's ever seen anything like this before. The people that are working on it do it with incredible heart and love, and they want something to happen. They don't want to be wasting time like people have been wasting for many years, even people in this position. They've been wasting time and not a lot of money, I have to tell you. They haven't spent, as you know, they haven't been spending a lot of money. We're now spending a lot of money. We look forward to launching these principles in the coming months. And we will not rest until we've stopped every last human trafficker and liberated every last survivor. So I'm now pleased to introduce an incredible survivor and the newest member of the U.S. Advisory Council on Human Trafficking, Bella Haneke. Hi, Bella. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Bella Hunake. Thank you, President Trump, Ms. Ivanka Trump, um, in the White House for organizing this important event. Um, it is truly a great honor to be here to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Um, at age 13, I was brought into this country. Um, I survived trafficking along with 19 other girls. <clears throat> Afterwards, I was placed in foster care. Uh, but this negative experience um, in my past should not wholly define who I am today. Um, <clears throat> Uh, today, I am a college graduate. Today, I am an American citizen. And today, I stand before you as the newest member of the U.S. Advisory Council on Human Trafficking. Um, 
Um, the council is composed of survivor leaders who bring their experience and expertise to advise and provide recommendations to the president's tax force um, to monitor and combat trafficking in persons. We represent a diverse range of backgrounds and experiences, and we are sincerely grateful to this administration for appointing our current aid members to support federal government efforts to prevent um, and improve trafficking programs and policies. We view the existence of this council as a victory for trafficking survivors and the federal government. <clears throat> this council is a model for survivor empowerment and survivor center approaches that other countries, states, and localities may learn from and adapt. This council shows in real and tangible ways how survivors can positively impact and inform anti-trafficking efforts at the highest levels of government. To truly be survivor-centered and informed means to not only prioritize survivors' needs or wishes and service delivery, it must also include meaningful collaboration <clears throat> with survivors to inform the design and implementation of the very policies and programs that affect them. No survivors should ever be viewed by their trafficking or lived experiences alone. We acknowledge the great strides the federal government has made in the last 20 years to combat trafficking, as well as that of other stakeholders. We look forward to continuing to advise and collaborate with the task force to realize the goals of the TVPA, and we encourage all of you to view our 2020 annual report, which will be released this April. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. And to end, I would like to uh, share a, a statement and a quote from our council's chair, the Honorable Judge Long Robert. This is to the victims and survivors out there. It's never been your fault no matter what. So let go of that toxic shame. It doesn't belong to you. You are never too old, too lost, or too broken to begin healing today. Hope is key, and even if it starts out as small as a mustard seed, nurture hope. It'll save you. And most importantly, you're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. Thank you, and God bless America. Mr. President, Attorney General Barr, members of the Council, Ivanka, Cabinet Secretaries, members of our diplomatic corps, including Ambassador Gingrich, distinguished members of Congress who've worked on this issue for so many years with such heart and compassion, members of the law enforcement community and faith leaders, and most especially Bella and the courageous survivors who join us here today. It is an honor to be with you on this historic day. As the President reflected, we're here to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. As the President's made clear, from his heart, we have a President who knows human trafficking is not only an unconscionable evil, but an epidemic in the world today in the United States of America will confront it as never before. <laughs> Mr. President, you said in your proclamation marking this past month that human trafficking is an affront to humanity and you've taken decisive action to bring human traffickers to justice, their victims to safety, and to help survivors walk the difficult road to recovery. Like no president before you, You've made it a priority to target transnational criminal organizations that have victimized thousands of innocent people on both sides of our borders. I know the President and I are grateful for the efforts of all of those gathered here today, for your compassion, for shining light in the darkness, and bringing the justice and determination of the American people to this cause. But uh, permit me to add one more voice of appreciation to a member of this administration who has probably articulated the President's message on this issue with more compassion and more determination than anyone else 
in the history of this movement. Would you join me in thanking Ivanka Trump one more time for her extraordinary leadership on human trafficking. Mr. President, the order you're about to sign will impact the federal response across our government and uh, empower the agencies so well represented here to have even more tools to combat the scourge of human trafficking. It will improve the way law enforcement federal agencies gather information. It will also make it easier for the American people to partner with this administration and with law enforcement in combating human trafficking. It will empower faith-based organizations to provide victims and survivors with more compassionate care. And with more and more young people around America engaged in this issue, Mr. President, uh, by your order today, you will give younger Americans, especially the ability on the internet to identify the signs of trafficking, what dangers to avoid, and how to break free if they've been victimized. Our founding documents attest that we believe that every person is endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And today, with the compassion and determination of all of those gathered here, Mr. President, you again show the American people's commitment to the justice and dignity and worth of every person. And we thank you for your leadership and compassion. So, Mike, thank you very much, and I just want to uh, congratulate everybody in this room. What I'd like to do is maybe ask some of our folks that are so involved to come up and the survivors to come up. We will sign, and uh, we will say hello to everybody. And again, it's an honor to be with you today. Thank you very much. It's a big moment. Thank you.